Very special Grand Rounds talk. Um, it was originally scheduled over a year ago uh, with Dr. Reagan Geisinger, and it was like slated to be on the topic of hemodynamic considerations in HIE. And unfortunately and very sadly, we lost Reagan last night. Um, and Patrick has graciously um, and still uh, stepped in for her. So I'm not going to take any more time. I'm going to hand it over to Patrick. I think everyone knows who he is. He is a, the, one of the foremost international experts in hemodynamics and neonatology um, and a dear mentor and friend of Dr. Reagan Geisinger, whom this Grand Rounds is dedicated to. Patrick, Patrick, I'm so sorry, but we, I, it seems that you're muted. And this is such an important part. Let me see here. Okay. Now there we go. Yeah. Let me just do that again. Sorry, it's Teams. Yeah. Okay, just let me know if you can when you can see the slides, Clara. Perfect. Yes, I've got your slides and I have audio. Please, people, let us know in the chat or just by unmuting if you um, have any difficulties with this. Okay. So thank you, Clara, for the the warm introduction. This is a a very hard day. In January 2010. I traveled to London, Ontario to give two talks. Functional echo and enhanced decision making in the NICU towards a rational approach to the PDA. Little did I know, but in the audience was a bright young neonatologist who prior to that day had thought, how we manage the cardiovascular system makes no sense. And many years later, Reagan shared with me when I heard you speak that day, it was the first time something resonant resonated and I heard someone make sense of what seemed totally illogical based on what people were telling me. From that point on, Reagan dedicated her life to hemodynamics. She contacted my admin assistant to find out when I was next on service so she could complete an elective as a pediatric resident to get noticed. It was then I realized how uniquely brilliant she was. After completing her fellowship in Toronto, she then applied for hemodynamics. The second year of her fellowship was tough as there was some concern I may be leaving sick kids. But she interviewed and her interview was probably one of the most unique experiences I've had in an interview. There were two sentinel questions. One, what if you don't get this? Because this is highly competitive. And Reagan said in the confident voice, as always, I will come back and I will keep coming back until I get this. This was an unsecured position in terms of salary. So the other question was, how can you maintain yourself financially through the year? What's your plan? And Reagan said, well, I, I'll get a job in transport and do call in transport or I'll kind of do a third year fellowship. So I remember saying, OK, Reagan, what if you don't get any of those things? And she said, I'll work at McDonald's. From that day, she dedicated her life to the field of hemodynamics. So when I made the decision to move to Iowa in 2018, my first act was to ask Reagan to come and be the director of the hemodynamics program. Despite her young age, she's had huge global impact through more than 70 publications, more than 50 international and national talks. But I would say her greatest achievement has been reshaping the minds of so many young trainees and building the culture of the hemodynamics movement in neonatology. Just today, one comment I received from a former fellow, if Reagan was an artist, then I am one of her creations. <laughs> 
a trainee she guides and molded into ship. Today, Reagan is an angel watching over every hemodynamics program in the world. She is truly the mother of the emerging field of hemodynamics. So I ask each of you who were trained by Reagan, who were blessed to have been influenced by her words or actions to let her spirit live on within each of you. Someone else said to me today, Reagan was your left hand. You're like one person. To which I said, no, Reagan was my right hand. Everything that was good about me was Reagan. And I will forever be indebted. As Clara said, today was mentioned to be her, not supposed to be her talk. As a hemodynamics clinician, Reagan dedicated herself to the NICU, was available 365 days of the year, 24 seven for any sick baby and the baby with severe pulmonary hypertension, the ECMO candidate was her forte. I dedicate this talk to you, Reagan. My heart is broken. I need you to do a hemodynamics consult on me. Thank you, Reagan, for all you've done. So I want to try to take you through, you know, some of the lessons we've learned in the management of pulmonary hypertension. I want to start off with something that's a little recent and a little bit of a curveball. And I share this also at PAS. And one of Reagan's real passions was the physiologic approach to acute pulmonary hypertension in preterm infants. And it was very much driven by, you know, the lack of progress that we've seen, uh, particularly in terms of intraventricular hemorrhage in extremely preterm babies over the last 20 years, despite significant increases in survival. And what's particularly interesting is if one looks at parts of the world where the approach to care is at polar opposite, Japan, where it's a very aggressive uh, approach based on a lot of prophylactic therapies, prophylactic into medicine, prophylactic vasopressors, mandatory ventilation, to at the other extreme in Sweden, avoiding intubation and a very non-aggressive approach to many things, yet their survival rates are the same. And this is an important paradigm shift for us in neonatology because it doesn't make intuitive sense that polar opposite approaches to intensive care can lead to the same survival. And the only way I can make sense of this, and Reagan also kind of has a very similar viewpoint, is that in the center, which provides prophylactic, a lot of prophylactic therapies, there are patients who receive unnecessary treatment and suffer treatment related harm. And on the counter, in the centers, in which it's a very non-interventional approach, there may be diseases left untreated or unrecognized. Common to both approaches is diagnostic and therapeutic imprecision. I wanna share a few cases that will kind of give you some ideas of the complexity of the patients that we're dealing with and their need to actually move and change the paradigm to a much more physiologic precise approach to care. This is a 22 week outborn um, who had a difficult start and needed resuscitation, did have very little in the way of lung disease, but had early signs of hemodynamic instability with lactic acidosis, systolic hypotension, also was anemic. So if we start thinking about blood pressure and think about blood pressure in terms of systolic blood pressure, there's a marked variance in the diseases that may cause you to have low systolic blood pressure, one of which is pulmonary hypertension due to low preload to the left heart. This infant actually started off and did not have pulmonary hypertension, but actually had left ventricular systolic dysfunction, which was transitioned from debutamine to epinephrine. But over the next three hours, the infant developed a refractory encephalopathy with hypoxemic respiratory failure in the presence of a stable blood pressure, which prompted us to reevaluate his physiology. And now at six hours, we were dealing with a very different phenotype. This infant had stabilization of his left ventricular function, but his right ventricular function was severely abnormal with evidence of suprasystemic pulmonary hypertension through a uh, pretty much unrestricted right to left flow across the ductus. So in Iowa, our approach to acute pulmonary hypertension is oftentimes to start with low dose nitric oxide in patients that have clear echo evidence of pulmonary hypertension. But we've learned that many of these babies can be very vasoresponsive and wean from 100% oxygen to room air very quickly 
So the lower dose helps us to actually wean them a little faster. But one of the other things we've noticed is many of these babies who are the responders develop fairly significant postductal hypotension as the shunt across the ductus changes. So we recommended them to wean nitric oxide. So why share this with you? Well, there's a lot of confusion in neonatology. We have major national statements that suggest that nitric oxide has no role in preterm babies and actually may be either an un ineffective or a harmful therapy. And a lot of this relates to perhaps research that isn't correctly answering the question. So you've got this work here, just looking at the use of nitric oxide based on oxygenation need, suggesting that the more extremely preterm babies are more likely to be non-responders than responders. We also have randomized trials of prophylactic therapy with nitric oxide, suggesting no benefit in terms of BPD. When one starts to look, however, at a bit more precision in the selection of patients, one starts to see that infants, this is some work from our cohort in Toronto, infants who had a clear diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension uh, in the early transitional period had a much higher likelihood of responding to nitric oxide. And many of these patients who were nitric oxide responders had a much more favorable um, outcome, both in terms of survival and neurodevelopmental outcome than nitric oxide non-responders. Some data from the Iowa cohort again shows that you may have a response rate as high as 60% in the 22 to 26 weeks patients. However, there are some patients that may have a negative response, particularly if the physiology is not pulmonary hypertension. So getting back to this case, um, as we may have predicted, the physiology changed very quickly. And within a three hour period, when we went back and reevaluated this infant, there was evidence of resolution of the pulmonary hypertension, but now overcirculation physiology with a fairly high volume PDA shunt. So what this tells us is that in some extremely preterm babies, the pulmonary vascular bed is highly vasoresponsive and the physiology may change very rapidly. And if we don't pay attention to this, we may have major fluxes in flow from low flow to high flow, particularly in terms of the brain that potentially can be harmful. And if one looks back at the early trials of high frequency ventilation inhaled nitric oxide, you see evidence of significant intraventricular hemorrhage and neurohemodynamic abnormalities kind of in patients who had therapies that potentially decreased their pulmonary vascular resistance. Yet it was not necessarily well characterized mechanistically why this may have occurred. So this was something that prompted, and this was Reagan's idea, to suggest that if we are to change the paradigm in these tiny babies, we actually need to think differently about the physiology and recognize that the brain, and particularly the preductal circulation, changes in its hemodynamics as the ductus and pulmonary vascular resistance changes, such that as uh, your pulmonary vascular resistance falls, the augmentation in the left to right ductal shunt will drive an increase in preload to the left heart, which will ultimately drive preload to the brain, potentially setting up this um, kind of perfect milieu for ischemia reperfusion event. So this is what prompted us, you know, in Iowa to have a much more precise approach in the transitional period. I'm not going to go into any details about this because I want to really focus on pulmonary hypertension, but very much based on choosing the right physiology, whether it's PDA, pulmonary hypertension, heart dysfunction, and providing a physiology specific therapy. And, you know, the impact on this, of this has been fairly profound. This is a time series analysis looking at um, the outcome for preterm babies in terms of death or severe IVH in Iowa. Remembering that in 2008, we had about 21% of the sub 27 week population was born at 22 and 23 weeks. By 2018, that was close to 46%, which may explain this very, very marginal change in the odds ratio upwards. However, as you can see here, following introduction of hemodynamic screening, a fairly significant and profound reduction in this composite outcome that is, has been very much sustained. So it's pretty meaningful. And this, this, this manuscript has just been accepted uh, with the Blue Journal. So how do we move beyond the status quo? Well, I think the first thing is to recognize is that physiology is complex and dynamic. We don't talk about it enough. We don't think about it enough. But oftentimes people don't have the right information from a diagnostic or therapeutic precision to help them make the best decisions. 
which has really prompted the evolution of hemodynamics, you know, getting people to think beyond blood pressure and recognizing that to provide the best care, you need to have the most accurate information to do that. So pulmonary hypertension or acute pulmonary hypertension, as I like to talk about it, really is a disease of the pulmonary vascular bed, which may be associated with right ventricular failure and may be associated with shunts, which in many situations are helpful. The problems oftentimes relate to the fact that we, you know, drift away from treating the problem, which is a disease of right ventricular afterload, and focus on what is the systemic blood pressure and the targeting of artificially high levels to try to reverse the ductal shunt, which may not only be harmful to the right heart, but also places an increase in afterload to the left heart. So in trying to take care of these sick babies that have pulmonary hypertension, um, how do we need to change the field? Well, I think the first thing we need to recognize is that although nitric oxide and the high frequency ventilator in some situations are uh, very helpful, in other situations, one may not necessarily always need this approach. Precision of monitoring and choice of therapies really is the hallmark of care. So I think it's essential to recognize that one starts to think about pulmonary hypertension. The first thing that one needs to recognize, as mentioned previously, is it's a disease in which there's a brick wall being created in the lung. And therein lies the ultimate problem. We have a diminution of pulmonary blood flow. In some respects, from a physiologic perspective, we probably should be talking about acute pulmonary hypoperfusion as a disease rather than pressure. And we'll come back to that later on because pressure is not always a problem. But in terms of etiology, it's also important to recognize there are patients with lung disease and patients without lung disease. Hence, nitric oxide plus oscillator as husband and wife may not necessarily be the right approach if you've got normal lungs. In managing pulmonary hypertension, it's important to recognize you know, some key physiologic concepts. I think concept number one is it takes pulmonary vascular resistance or pressure time to decrease. During this early transitional period, the pulmonary vascular bed is highly vasoreactive. But secondly, if one looks at Abe Rudolph's graph looking at PO2 versus pulmonary vascular resistance, what you can see is above the cut point of 50 millimeters of mercury, excessive augmentation in PO2 will not lead to further reductions in pulmonary vascular resistance and theoretically, in combination with nitric oxide and the generation of the superoxide anion, and proxy nitrate may be physiologically counterintuitive. Second important consideration is, as mentioned previously, it's a disease of afterload. And we know, as you can see in the graph on the left-hand side, the slope of the line, when one looks at afterload on the x-axis to contractility on the y-axis, is much steeper in the newborn compared to the older child, suggesting that increments in afterload have a much more dramatic effect on heart contractility. And when one looks at this relationship in the right ventricle versus the left ventricle, you can see that this effect is accentuated. Second important consideration is what we call the force frequency relationship, which is the relationship between heart rate and contractility. If one has an effective functioning force frequency relationship, increases in heart rate may be associated with increases in contractility. However, if you choose the wrong drug, and you give something which increases heart rate, like dopamine, but does not augment RV function because you're increasing afterload to the right ventricle, you get a blunted force frequency relationship, which now adds on the negative effect of compromised to coronary artery perfusion as you further limit diastolic filling time. Third important concept is the concept of RV to LV interaction, and this is particularly important in trying to navigate biventricular heart dysfunction, which is the dominant ventricle, because reality is that the fibers of the LV and the RV, as you can see from this MR schematic, are very interrelated, suggesting that if one ventricle is primarily affected, there may be a secondary effect on the other ventricle. The final most important concept is the concept of the relationship between pressure and flow. And this, as I mentioned previously, is you know why perhaps pulmonary hypertension may in itself not be the right diagnosis, particularly given the fact that pressure may be elevated because of flow or because of resistance. 
Okay, and in the setting of the disease we're talking about today, acute pulmonary hypoperfusion disorders due to elevated PVR, flow is compromised. So that when you give a medication like nitric oxide, initially resistance falls, flow increases, atrial pressure also increases, you may actually have very little effect on pressure. And when we look at these babies with echo, 30 minutes to an hour to two hours after receiving nitric oxide, they wean to room air, but they still have pulmonary hypertension on the echo. The second important consideration is in disorders in which the flow may be elevated, causing high pressure such as AV malformations, these patients may be well oxygenating because they're VQ matching fine. So again, just speaking to the, la the last thing I've just said here, this is one example of an infant that was born with acute profound hypoxemia. You can see he's got a fairly significant dilation of his right heart. He's got major retrograde flow in the postdoctoral arch. This infant had signs of a low cardiac output state. But on echocardiography, his pulmonary hypertension was not because of high pulmonary vascular resistance. He had torrential flow in the pulmonary vascular bed. So pressure is not just always because of elevated resistance. And for this reason, you may be sick in a low cardiac output state because you've got plenty of pulmonary blood flow. But in this physiology here, which is flow mediated pulmonary hypertension, the infant may be in a low cardiac output state because the flow across the ductus right to left is insufficient to support the compromised flow preductally that's being sucked up into this giant vacuum cleaner in the brain. So drugs like or therapies like oxygen, nitric oxide would be very detrimental for a baby like this with an AV malformation. Third scenario is an infant who was um, born uh, significantly hypoxic, had evidence of lactic acidosis, who's a surfactant non-responder. So do you scan the baby or do you put the baby on nitric oxide? Well, on this baby's kind of echocardiogram that was done, what you can actually see is that yes, there was elevated pressure on the right side of the heart, but the primary problem was the left side of the heart. This infant had fairly profound left ventricular systolic dysfunction leading to a low cardiac output state. But remembering in the postcapillary phenotype in which atrial pressure is high, and pulmonary venous pressure is high, it will also have a secondary effect on the right heart, which may lead to pulmonary hypertension. So lesson number three, not all pulmonary hypertension is of uh, arterial origin. The postcapillary phenotype, or as we talk about the left heart masquerader, is an important thing to think, think about, as it may be also harmed by uh, the use of pulmonary vasodilators. This phenotype also is seen in the setting of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Many of you or most of you are very familiar with that. There are potentially two phenotypes, the right heart phenotype in which nitric oxide may play a role. These infants classically have a very dilated pressure loaded right heart, which may be dysfunctional with a right to left shunt across the ductus and atrial septum. Unlike the left heart phenotype, which we're learning more and more about, these infants will have a small, potentially underdeveloped left heart and will have secondary pulmonary venous hypertension. And the distinguishing factor in these patients here is in the presence of a right to left ductal shunt, you will have a left to right atrial shunt. That's an important consideration in terms of management because, you know, on this post capillary phenotype, the use of, again, vasodilators like oxygen or nitric oxide may be harmful in some of these patients. Gabriel Alta's work shows very nicely the importance of recognizing you know, the left heart phenotype and that infants that have fairly significant heart dysfunction are much more likely to end up needing an ECMO. Again, work from Neil Patel, again, highlights the importance of distinguishing these subcategories of infants with heart dysfunction. The left or the biventricular dysfunction uh, in particular are associated with a worse survival, highlighting the importance of precision, not just in your selection of therapies, but also in monitoring these patients. The final scenario I want to present with, and again, just to just to close the loop on the, the variance and the possibilities that one sees with these patients was a term baby that was born that apparently looked like he had pulmonary hypertension, had a very wide pre postductal oxygen saturation, was intubated to, to optimize oxygenation. And it made sense that he had pulmonary hypertension because his APGARs were low, 
he looked like he was asphyxiated. This is the, the trajectory of this baby here. Um, started to develop kind of worsening lactic acidosis for which he was started on dibutamine. Ultimately ended up going into 100% oxygen because he had a very, very low postductal oxygen saturation. For which then he was clinically started on nitric oxide, which uh, really led to not much change um, in his um, uh, oxygen requirements, but was associated with a progressive increase in his lactate. Now, why share this case? Well, if you do a very limited assessment of this baby here, what you will see is that his right heart looks like it's dilated, it's dysfunctional, okay, uh, which in the setting of HIE with pulmonary hypertension makes sense that this baby has potentially severe pulmonary hypertension. And if you went on and did objective measures of pulmonary vas or RV function, you can see they truly are all abnormal. He needs clear support for his right ventricle. But further interrogation revealed that this baby actually had more than one pathology. Here you can see kind of a significant shelf in the postductal arch. So going down the pathway of eliminating his right to left ductal shunt, is potentially very harmful in this setting. So the team stopped his nitric oxide, transitioned him to epinephrine, started dibutamine. And what you can see is he had normalization of his lactates, normalization of his blood pressures. But you can see his, he continued to have a pre post oxygen saturation gradient in room air. So lesson here, not all pre post saturation gradients equate to acute pulmonary hypertension. One always needs to think of cardiovascular disease and left heart disease in these infants, particularly in the early transitional period. So in summary, again, you know, we need to think differently about pulmonary hypertension. Pressure itself is not always the problem. The problem is either a problem of flow, resistance, or atrial pressure. And the approach to treatment should be driven, should be driven by the subcomponents of this relationship rather than the fact that the pressure is high in itself. So this takes us to the importance then of evaluation. And if one is to provide the best therapy or the most optimal approach to pulmonary hypertension, a multi-parametric approach to evaluating pulmonary hemodynamics in terms of pressure, resistance, the impact to the right ventricle, the impact to the left ventricle, and the impact to systemic blood flow. And part of the reason it's being comprehensive relates to the fact that many of our kind of traditional conventional assessments of pulmonary hypertension have relied on subjective assessment, which as you can see from Ashleen Smith's study in Toronto, when we looked at 60 babies of whom 30 were healthy, 30 had pulmonary hypertension, when experts were asked, does the right ventricle look dilated? Is the septum flat? Does the ORV look subjectively dysfunctional, which is the standard of care in 95% of echoes performed across North America? You can see the Kappa coefficient is, is, is very, very unreliable suggesting that to really evaluate pulmonary hypertension, one needs a comprehensive assessment. There are other important considerations as we think even about some of the quantitative measures that we use for pulmonary hypertension. So most people are familiar with tricuspid regurgitation jet, which is used to calculate according to the Bernoulli equation, right ventricular systolic pressure. The limitations or challenges with the RV or the TR jet is that if the right ventricle is profoundly dysfunctional, which is oftentimes the case in the sickest patients, you will actually underestimate the RV systolic pressure. What about the ductus? The ductus is certainly a very helpful way to quantify flow. Um, and you know, an unrestricted right to left shunt tells you that you've got super systemic pulmonary pressures, but the ductus is not always present. The other important consideration with flow across the PDA and again, getting back to the pressure equals flow times resistance relationship, does a right to left ductal shunt mean you always have pulmonary hypertension? Well, here are two scenarios uh, which are polar opposite situations. Both babies had unrestricted right to left flow across their PDA. This first infant was a 23 weeker who, as you can see, is in a lot of oxygen on a modest setting on the ventilator, has extremely low flow in the pulmonary veins extremely low outputs, and a flat septum. This infant truly has pulmonary arterial hypertension due to elevated pulmonary vascular resistance with an impairment in RV function, 
and would benefit from pulmonary vasodilators and positive inotropy. Here's the second case of the baby that has an unrestricted right to left ductal shunt. This baby was very hypotensive. So a limited assessment, one may think this is pulmonary hypertension. But if you actually look at this baby, flow in the pulmonary veins is high. His cardiac output is on the normal to upper range. His right ventricular output is also well preserved. And you can see his eccentricity index is normal. This is not pulmonary hypertension. This is vasodilator shock. And the reason the baby has a very significant right to left ductal shunt is because he's systemically so vasodilated. The use of pulmonary vasodilators would be harmful in this situation. And when you see these patients, one starts to wonder in randomized trials of nitric oxide, how often did we enroll babies on the basis of a right to left ductal shunt when they actually probably did not have pulmonary hypertension? So for the last five, 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about treatment. And how do we think about pulmonary hypertension? Well, it really falls down to recognizing what the problem is. Elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. And to optimize care, we want to improve pulmonary blood flow. And in doing that, hopefully we offload the right ventricle and support better pulmonary venous return, which will lead to better cardiac output, better systolic blood pressure, and less hypotensive. So in doing that, there are pulmonary vasodilators like nitric oxide, positive inotropes like dibutamine, low-dose epinephrine, and drugs like milonone, which have got both inotropy and vasodilator effects. And if you truly are systemically hypotensive, using medications that will increase your blood pressure to a normal level without increasing your pulmonary vascular resistance and also minimizing the effects of tachycardia. So this case here is the real case, and this was a baby shortly after we arrived in Iowa who came from another hospital. Profoundly sick baby, um, had a kind of initial echo that confirmed some pulmonary hypertension, was given nitric oxide, um, had initially a normal blood pressure, but then he started to become hypotensive as his mean air pressure was increased, for which he was started on the dopamine. Dopamine was increased, continued to be very hypoxic, his blood pressure continued to be low, so he then was started on some norepinephrine, epinephrine, all with a view to increase the blood pressure and try to reverse the ductal shunt. But although they normalized the blood pressure, he remained profoundly hypoxic with elevated lactate and was also extremely tachycardic. So on arrival to the program in Iowa, you can see here, you know, this is the classic phenotype of these babies very dilated, pressure-loaded right heart, empty-looking left heart. You can see the image is not very clear because he's on so much mean airway pressure that's limiting the ability to visualize the heart as well as we normally do. And he also had a very small, restrictive kind of PDA. So how do we approach the management of this baby here? Well, in thinking about infants with INO refractory pulmonary hypertension, as mentioned previously, we can give drugs to vasodilate, drugs like milonone. However, if you're already very hypotensive, you're not going to actually do the baby favors by actually further dropping their systemic blood pressure. Can we give medications to optimize RV function? Can we use prostaglandin to open the duct to better support the systemic blood pressure? And then as mentioned previously, can we manipulate the balance between pulmonary and systemic vascular resistance? Milonone is a drug that has not been yet subjected to a randomized controlled trial in newborns outside of the setting of congenital heart disease. Biologically, it makes a lot of sense in pulmonary hypertension, given it's a disease of afterload. Plus also, there's animal data and human cath lab data of the synergistic effects of nitric oxide and milonone by increasing the bioavailability of cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP. Data is limited to observational studies, many of which kind of we've published kind of both in Toronto and in Dublin and uh, through pharmacological studies, which have shown that it is effective in further augmenting the reduction in oxygenation index and FiO2 and optimizing both right and left ventricular function. However, there are some caveats. And, you know, again, this was thanks to the observation of Reagan when we were in Toronto 
She noticed that, particularly in the setting of infants who were asphyxiated, undergoing cooling, that milorelin was actually associated with fairly profound and refractory hypotension. Adrian Bischoff, who was one of our fellows at the time, did this um, observational comparative study in which she looked at three groups, infants who had um, HIE uh, with no milorelin exposure, and those are the babies in the green boxes. And you can see that those babies had a stable systolic and diastolic pressure. Infants who received milorinone in the setting of pulmonary hypertension, but were not asphyxiated, so these are the milorinone controls, those purple triangles, again, showed a fairly stable systolic and diastolic pressure after use. However, the red circles were the infants who were asphyxiated with pulmonary hypertension, who received milorinone. You can see not only did the systolic and diastolic blood pressure drop fairly quickly, it was sustained despite a fairly profound increase in the inotrope score here, which you can see on the graph on the right. So Milleron has merit in pulmonary hypertension, but at least in the setting of HIE, we need to be cautious. I want to just spend a minute to talk about HIE because this is Reagan's day and the hemodynamics of HIE was her focus. You know, this was a domain for which we had very, very little attention. And, you know, some of the first publications on the importance of hemodynamics were from Reagan. And this is her schematic, you know, demonstrating that potentially at the level of the insult, the modulator effect of hypothermia or rewarming, there's major, major potential changes going on, kind of both in heart function and loading conditions and flow that may all contribute to an abnormal outcome. This is particularly important because the clinical signs we have are not very good. The babies are asphyxiated, so their lactate and, and gases are already abnormal. The kidneys don't work very well, so urinary output is not necessarily a good sign. And because they're cooled, they'll already look pale and poorly perfused. And because of their encephalopathy, they may have decreased activity. So one of the central publications kind of was that really emphasized the importance of looking at the cardiovascular system in HIE was kind of Reagan's observational study, which he looked at a cohort of 60 babies and demonstrated very clearly that infants that had severe right ventricular dysfunction, independent of the severity of HIE, independent of their illness severity, this predicted death or abnormal MRI, and also subsequently at two years of age, it predicted abnormal neurodevelopmental outcome, suggesting that managing the right ventricle, identifying disease early, and perhaps better monitoring and managing the hemodynamics may be beneficial for these babies. Another important consideration in the setting of HIE is that under the same phenotype, and particularly the infant who is got an infant of a diabetic mother, you may get very different phenotypes. Again, emphasizing the importance of, you know, kind of integrating echocardiography into the care of these babies. These are three babies that were all hypoxic, all in a low cardiac output state. But as you can see, their physiologies are completely different. The baby on the left was hyperinflated um, and had compromised flow. Sorry, someone's, could you turn your mic off? Please. Um, the patient was hyperinflated, had limited flow to their left heart. The baby in the middle had a severely dysfunctional right ventricle. The baby on the right hand side had a hypertrophic heart. So how do we choose the right vasopressor? This is really the, the last kind of few slides of the talk. Dopamine is the standard of care and most of you know that you know I have a pretty strong opinion that in the setting of pulmonary hypertension it is not the right medication. We have no evidence that it does anything good. That's the starting point. There's not a single study showing any benefit. Everything we have, whether it's animal or human, suggests that biologically and physiologically, the effects are not desirable. These are actually slides that Reagan made. Here you can see, and this is from Keith Barrington's work, that dopamine administration was associated with an increase in pressure in the pulmonary vascular bed without any positive benefit to systemic pressure or systemic flow. Epinephrine may be more desirable, but it also led to an increase in pulmonary pressure. This is not just limited to one study. This is some work from Manicieri in the piglet model, where they looked at high-dose dopamine versus low-dose dopamine with epinephrine. And what you can see is that, yes, there was an increase in mean arterial pressure systemically, but 
the effects on pulmonary artery pressure was much, much higher. So if one is trying to reverse the ductal shunt, you're probably not going to be able to do it. Dopamine and epi in combination or high dose dopamine were associated with a negative effect on the PVR to SVR ratio. What about norepinephrine? There's some suggestion that norepinephrine may be better. I certainly think it's better than dopamine, but I'm still not so sure in the most profoundly ill babies, is it the right medication? This is some work from Satyan, which looked at the effect of norepinephrine in the presence of 100% oxygen. And you can see it's a potent pulmonary vasoconstrictor. These effects may be palliated uh, to a certain extent when you use superoxide dismutase. There's also some evidence from, and again, this is not neonatal, this is younger children who were in the cath lab. And what happened was these children were initially given milrinone. And you can see following the addition of milrinone, their systemic vascular resistance fell, as did their pulmonary vascular resistance. They were then randomized to receive norepinephrine or a vasopressin analog. And what you can see that both medications led to a normalization of SVR, but only the vasopressin group maintained the reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance in the norepi group. You can see it went back up to the pretreatment level. Vasopressin biologically is a drug with very interesting effects with a dicosmous effect on the V1 receptor in the systemic vascular bed where it's the vasoconstrictor, but in the pulmonary, coronary, and cerebral vascular beds, it's a vasodilator. Our evidence, again, like Milleron, unfortunately, is still limited to random to, to, to observational studies, but certainly, and this is from the Toronto cohort, there's Adele Muhammad's work in term babies. It's also has been replicated in preterm babies. You can see that recovery of your systemic blood pressure is associated with improvement in oxygenation index in these babies here. So to wrap up, let's go back to that baby. And I want my last words to be Reagan's last words. What did Reagan do? when a baby came in like that one that you saw when she came to the bedside, that baby who's on massive doses of dopamine, norepi, etc. Well, first she got rid of the bad drugs, the drugs that were increasing PVR and got rid of them fairly quickly. And as she got rid of them, she titrated the babies up to a very high dose of vasopressin between 1.5 to 3 units very quickly, which is more friendly to the pulmonary vascular bed. She would empirically start the babies on prostaglandin if the ductus was restrictive, particularly if there was RV dysfunction. And once she stabilized the blood pressure, she would add in milrinone, and we would then have the MVP approach, milrinone plus vasopressin. But more than, important than anything, she didn't leave the bedside, oftentimes for hours and hours, monitoring these babies closely with serial echocardiography. And that's what happened in that particular case. You can see as we got rid of the dopamine and norepi changed to vasopressin, the heart rate came down, the blood pressure remained pretty much the same, but the baby started to oxygenate better, at which point we added milrinone, which was then associated with progressive improvement. So to wrap up, I hope I've convinced you that pulmonary hypertension is a complex physiologic spectrum in which the actual physiologic subphenotypes of flow, resistance, and atrial pressure are the more important determinants of therapy, not necessarily the fact that the pressure is elevated. Comprehensive hemodynamic evaluation may help you not just make it a, a more accurate diagnosis, but individualize the care to hopefully improve the outcomes for these babies here. Thank you very, very much, and um, I'm happy to take some questions.